in E-Team in particular, we had a somewhat unusual circumstance, which is we were traveling with a group of people who already had serious security protocols. So Human Rights Watch has heavy security protocols that they go through before the E-Team can go anywhere. And we went together with the E-Team with their security protocols and with their uh, assistance in those countries that helped them get in. So that was a huge benefit. Um, we weren't going in by ourselves. We were going in with people who had a sort of a system for getting into the countries in the first place. When we first met with the E-Team about making this film, we immediately had a logistical conversation about like, well, how would that work? How would we bring a camera crew to follow the work of the E-Team, which is so intimate and sensitive and somewhat dangerous in these countries overseas? And they said, you know, there's probably gonna be some places where a camera crew can't come, but hopefully there'll be some places where we can bring a camera crew, and those are the times we'll bring you guys. And we said, okay. And this was maybe, you know, years before Arab Spring started. Um, and then we finally got funding in 2011 early 2011, and then a couple months later, Tunisia started, and then Egypt. And then later on, we got a phone call saying, you know what, we're going back into Libya. It's open, one area is open by the rebels. We think maybe we can bring a camera. And then they said, but it has to be one person. And you're gonna squeeze in the car with us. Uh, and Ross was the cameraman, and I recorded sound. We had another shoot in Libya later that year, and Ross wasn't able to go. Uh, and so we hired a freelancer who was working in the region named James Foley. And so he did some shooting for us in Libya. Um, and he was later captured, a year later, he was captured in Syria on another mission. Uh, and we didn't know what happened to him and we were hoping that he'd be released and we were working with his family to try to raise awareness about his disappearance. Um, and we were you know, horrified to learn that over a year later he was eventually executed. Um, but a very long time ago, you know, back in 2011, he did some shooting for us that, that's ended up in the final film with some great footage in Libya. Our producer, Marilyn Ness, was looking for somebody to travel to Syria with the E-Team uh, and film. And it's a, this, is a big, this is a big ask of someone, you know, saying, I need you to go to Turkey, I need you to smuggle yourself across the border with these intrepid investigators. And so Marilyn called DP after DP after DP. And pretty much they all said, you know, my wife or my girlfriend says, no, I can't go, it's too dangerous. And so finally Marilyn got this 24-year-old woman who didn't have a wife or a girlfriend to say, you can't go. And she said, I'll go. Uh, she said, but you gotta call my mom every day, tell her I'm alive. So Marilyn, our producer's job was to get a security call from Syria every day saying, Rachel's still okay. And she would call Rachel's mom and say, Rachel's still okay. Um, but Rachel's very talented and very brave. And she and Anya both, you know, put on a burqa um, and smuggled themselves across the border, ran across the barbed wire like we feature in the film. And Rachel filmed it while they were doing that. And uh, thanks to her, we have that really remarkable footage that we can use in the film that gives you a sense of how difficult it is to get into a place where it's not open to outsiders and foreigners who want to talk about what's going on. It's certainly true that um, in recent years, there's been a lot of overlap between journalism and activism, between journalism and filmmaking, filmmaking and activism. There's just a lot of interplay going on, especially in the overseas coverage. Um, and Human Rights Watch, interestingly, is sort of in the middle of that. Like, um, a lot of the research and documenting that Human Rights Watch does overseas is used in place of journalism because there aren't journalists there anymore because so many international bureaus have closed down overseas. So a lot of the people Human Rights Watch hires as researchers now are former journalists who are now not just, do, they're, so they're doing the same kind of meticulous um, investigative work they did as journalists, but then they're also attempting to put together that material in order to make a case to try to end the abuse that they're seeing happening. So it's a twist. It's an adding an activist component to a simple investigative task that they were trained as as journalists. So there's that element. Um, and, and then there's people like us who are filmmakers first, but there is a somewhat journalistic component. Some of our footage was used by the press. And then there's a somewhat activist component in that some of our footage in the film is being used to try to raise awareness about human rights. So there is that bleed there too. There's a lot of instability in these countries, and there's also a lot of people like Rachel, Beth Anderson, and James Foley, who are two of our cinematographers working overseas, who are, you know, they're taking a lot of personal risks. Um, 
and hoping for great rewards, hoping that they can make some great films and also hoping that they can make a difference. The team benefited from a lot of young people who were interested in you know, brave young people who wanted to make a difference. People like Rachel Beth Anderson, Rachel Beth Anderson, and James Foley, who did some filming for us in Syria and in Libya. Um, and you know, their work is amazing, and their attitude towards it is amazing. Like they just want to keep going back and keep filming. They're just they're into it, um, and it's now their thing. They're like the new generation. You know, I think I think every set of long-term conflicts creates a new generation. It is risky. I mean, it's physically risky, and uh, you learn a lot really fast, um, but you also have to have a certain kind of, it's not for everyone, I would say. I mean, I don't want to discourage people from doing it, but I think it, you know, it can be, it can be very dangerous, and it can be very hard, apart from the danger, to get your footage out into the world and have it be something meaningful. So, but for some people, that's what they want to do. And so if that's really what people want to do and that they feel like they're really connected to that region or connected to that kind of work, then it's for them.